Um, so what I would like to do today is to finish up from the last four days or eight lectures, and I'm glad you had the stamina to sit through them. I hope I did not confuse you too much. So I will try to summarize here and there, again now focusing more specifically on principles and to give one or the other more specific example. And then we can seamlessly migrate into our question time, and I hope you have some questions and I'm happy to try to explain what I failed to explain properly or maybe try another version of explanation so you at least have answers to your most pressing questions. And we can then perhaps discuss how we organize the questions, whether we go through lecture by lecture or topic by topic or species by species, or we just do it randomly so you can put me to the test at the very end. Yesterday I failed to show you a video, just as a recap, about this uh, very nice experiment that came from the laboratory of uh, my colleague, Professor Melinsky. He works with sticklebacks, and I explained to you how these sticklebacks were a nice animal model and a sign of evolutionary conservation of MHC-dependent mate choice. And I was trying to explain the experiment with my hands. I'm sure I failed completely, but I recovered the video last night. But before I come to this, I wanted to remind you that what I was talking about as results and experiments from my own laboratory, that of course is to 99.9% .9 not done by my own hands. It's done by this group of very dedicated people. And whenever I go for talks, and I will do that here as well, I have this line down here. So in principle, my laboratory is a postdoctoral laboratory, so mostly postdoctoral fellows. We have the one odd PhD student from time to time. Uh, but mostly we work with, or I work with uh, postdocs. So should you be interested and wish to be entertained as a potential candidate, you are welcome to write to me. But uh, it's not purely postdoctoral. Um, we also run a, what is called in our society, an international Max Planck research school. And that is meant to be a PhD program that goes for between three and four years, depending on uh, how fast you complete your projects. And it's run in our institute in conjunction with the University of Freiburg, who confers the degree, or these, the Faculty of Biology confers the degree of a, 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 a PhD, because we cannot confer PhD degrees. Um, should you be interested in this program, you can look at this web page. But if you use anything that is vaguely like this, the search engines will direct you in the right direction and you can go and have a look. Um, this is financed by stipends and these stipends are uh, sufficient to allow you to make a decent living even in an expensive city like Freiburg. It's probably not as expensive as St. Petersburg I learned during the last days. But anyway, so um, um, it's worth checking out if you're interested in carrying out your PhD work uh, elsewhere. It's a very international place. There's hardly any German there, so you will certainly be exposed to a number of different nationalities from South America to Japan, across the entire globe. And I'm told that the students like it. Of course, if I say this is just pure propaganda, but I think you can learn a lot because it's a relatively diverse institute uh, in terms of topics and people. Um, You've got a feel of the kind of projects that we are doing, and I've, I'm sure that the projects that the other departments run are equally interesting, perhaps even more so. So it might be worth uh, considering this possibility. If you're not yourself interested, you might perhaps spread the word. Um, so now, now we come to this video that I promised. I'm explaining the experiment again so you can appreciate Ah, so we have to switch off the lights then. Um, so you can appreciate what this is all about. So this is a 
I'll just draw this on the blackboard here. So it's a laminar flow channel that has a, a net here and a net here. So there is one stream of water coming like this and there's another stream coming like this. And there is a female fish being placed into this area here. So this is a divider, but there is a flow, a, a laminar flow, so the laminar flow continues. So there is basically a separation between water A and water B column. And the female is free to choose between these water columns. And when it's being put into the, the tank, of course, it checks out the tank, can freely move here, but cannot escape into this direction, nor can it escape in this direction. And what is being measured is the time this fish spends in this flow of water or in this water column. And the argument is, of course, the female very rarely sits here right in the middle, and then it starts somewhere. I mean, this is just by chance, because it notices that the chant the, the flow comes and these fish always swim against the flow so it maybe she decides to go here first. Now if she likes the water that she can smell from here she might just stay there and then the experiment is void because she did not check out whether she liked that perhaps even better. So we have to wait until she's crossing this imaginary midline and has a chance to smell this water column and when she does the first crossing, then we, we start the clock. And then we let the, f the female basically swim around here and we count the time she spends in this or in this half. Because once she's exposed to this and to this, the argument is she can now compare and decide what she likes best. Okay, so that's the, it's a very simple experiment. Of course, the experiment is repeated with the same water columns, but in, in switched order, because some females tend to like the right side, some others tend to like the left side. So what you will notice here, up here, is a lamp that will uh, go to, into red when the water column is being started. This is the midline here, and this is the female. You just basically see only the shadow now. It's much nicer on my screen, but now let's start the video. There she is, midline, midline. Now it's a bit difficult. Can we switch off the light completely? Now she's on this side. You can see it. So tries. Okay, I can't go. Not good. She tries to escape from this water column not particularly interested in that water because if the water comes from here. Turns round. No. Another net. Can't go. Okay. Not good. But it's, it smells like male, okay? So she's sort of a little bit interested. Okay. Now, she can't escape here, so that somehow induces her to think perhaps she can escape by the other route. Takes a bit of time. Now, she's crossed. Okay, now the time, the clock is going, and now she has, is being exposed to the other male's water. Now watch her. Now she begins to think, I would like to meet that person. She really goes crazy and tries to escape through that net. A bit frustrated, tries again. It's kind of, would you like to dance with me? But the uh, chap is not responding. Now, then she retreats, thinks, what do I do? Try once again. Terrible man. <laughs> so you 
she now decides, okay, if he doesn't want me, maybe the other one does. <laughs> now he stinks. I'd rather go to the, to the old one again, see? And there she goes. So there is a clear preference, as you can see from here, and of course you have to do these experiments many times over, but there's a clear preference of this particular female for the smell of the male that is being put into this flow channel. And as I said yesterday, you can use these kind of experiments to confuse the female because we can predict based on the genetic structure of the MHC genes, we can predict which male she will prefer. Because I showed you that the, these females prefer some sort of optimal diversity for their offspring. They want to make sure that they are adapted enough to the local uh, uh, parasite fauna, yet be diverse enough to be able to, come, uh, uh, to uh, fight potential new challenges. So this, is, this creates this kind of optimal curve in terms of MHC diversity. And this is what the female counts. She counts in one way or another that we do not know. We know that she has a self-reference like mice have, as I showed you yesterday in this uh, pregnancy block. Mice know, and these fish know, how diverse their MHC complement is. And they can determine from the potential mate how diverse his MHC might be by counting or evaluating the different types of peptides that are released into the water here in the fish or into the urine or in the uh, bodily fluids in, in mammals. So the female just susses out, okay, this is my complement, this is his complement, and randomly assigned, of course, when I mix these haplotypes, okay, this would be good for my offspring. And this why she prefers one over the other male. And now if you, if, you ha if, you, if you can predict based on what we know of the optimal diversity that we see in nature, which is of course the product of selection, if we now expose the female to what we would call a suboptimal male, a male that has very low MHC diversity and of a kind that the female would never ever prefer, we can then spike this water from this male and add extra peptides that mimic more diverse MHC alleles. And now we let the female compare the original that is relatively uninteresting and one that is interest, uh, uninteresting plus extra peptides to make it more palatable and more interesting for the female. And more often than not, the female prefers this spiked water site. Uh, water side, yes. And conversely, when we have two males where one male is suboptimal, female is not interested, and one male is just about right for her, and she would normally choose this one, and then we use that water and add extra peptides, then this male is super optimal. It, the male is just too diverse, and the female also doesn't like the other extreme, and she would then go for the non-spiked version. So you can really predict what the outcome is. And it's, it's a bit sad, actually, that these females just follow these basic rules. They, they simply operate by counting MHC diversity, making some uh, algebraic calculation, and then go for one or the other, the other male. The male does not even have to be there. There is, there is other signals that uh, signal this is male water and not female water. It's just the peptides that do the trick. Well, I would say I'm quite pleased that we are not operating by MHC diversity alone. That would be a bit boring. There's a lot more that we use to choose mates, and these fish also do. If you're interested in this, females first look at the males, amazingly so, and they, for the, an attractive male for stickleback females is one that is bright red. So it has a very bright, brightly red, red-colored belly. It's a bit like the muscle man in humans, okay? So, and why is that? Because bright red skin indicates to the female that this male must be well-fed, probably not infected with too many parasites because it, it can invest a lot of metabolic energy in creating the color. 
Yeah? So this is kind of a secondary uh, sexual marker. So the female first checks out the male visually. And only the ones that look nice, then she starts the next level of evaluation. And I think, of course, not so simple, but in, in general terms, I think the same might be true for humans. We have a lot of indi indicators that we take into account when we begin approaching a potential mate. The yeah. looks, intelligence, the way we speak. Yeah, that's true. And uh, in, the, in the humans, for example, you can see some, uh, some examples when uh, women doesn't choose uh, optimal men, uh, like in general. But uh, are there such examples in well, I mean, for this, that's an instru instructive case also for these, um, these sticklebacks, if you are, but then we, we have to go on. But when, when, the, when the female matures and she produces eggs, and you can actually tell she had a very wide belly, so she's full of eggs. And the eggs, of course, grow and mature, and then she has to lay the eggs at some point. So. And there comes a point when, the, when the, the, the female is no longer so extremely choosy because she's forced to lay the eggs and then she has to make a compromise. Because in the end it's better perhaps to take a risk and attract a not so nice male rather than not to fertilize the eggs at all. Yeah, cool, thanks. Okay. So. For example, if I would walk the streets here, I can't speak any Russian, I would be a totally inferior person. I mean, you can't even speak to me. I mean, totally uninteresting. So this is what I wanted to show you. So there is a surprisingly simple mechanism by which uh, mate choice can operate on these, um, uh, on, on, on mate selection. We can now switch the light on, otherwise you fall asleep, I think. Um, so we can now try to move into what I was hoping to be able to tell you in the last... Okay. So. Now, I think I've prepared you now to appreciate if you haven't understood the principles yet, uh, for the, what I like to discuss all these projects, uh, or in, in what kind of framework I would like to discuss these projects, but what I call the design principles of vertebrate immune systems. And in principle, they are relatively similar, surprisingly at least, and I made, repeatedly make the, made the point that although the principles are the same, the mechanisms sometimes can um, use different types of molecules and this has to do in some way with the evolution of genomes and I'll come to this at the end of this uh, hour. So what do I mean by evolution of genomes? We know that the invertebrates basically operate within the frame of the same genomic and genetic complement. So they have the basic, base, same basic setup of genes that they, of course, can modify by local gene duplication to make a few copies more of one particular gene, so expand certain gene families or uh, contract certain gene families. But in general, the overall makeup of the genome is that of what is called just the basic um, uh, metazone makeup. And then we are experiencing um, genome duplications. There is a big debate now where these genome duplications have occurred. We certainly have good evidence for mammals that they have, or their ancestors rather, have undergone two rounds of complete genome duplication. So one, and then there's one R, one endoreduplication, so then we have two copies each, and another one that gives us four copies each. And I alluded to this when I was discussing the MHC um, uh, paralogous groups evidence for four similar syntenic regions, of course diversifying genes, losing genes, adding a few more here and there, but on the whole you can still see the evidence of these four genome uh, these two genome duplications making four copies 
of each gene. And what also seems to be the case is that um, the fragmented genome in terms of very small chromosomes that we, for example, see in lamprey and hackfish and also see in chicken has a change to the extent that chromosomes have fused and created longer chromosomes. Some, some organisms, as you know, have acrocentric chromosomes, others have metacentric chromosomes. There's a lot of diversity in terms of chromosome structures and that is linkage groups. But in general, synthetic relationships ships are quite well maintained. And when you look at synthetic relationships, for example, between sharks and humans, and I alluded to this, I think there is an amazing similarity there and there is quite a great stability. However, at certain uh, points in these chromosomes when there are synteny breaks, that is when the order of genes is not no longer conserved, often new genes are born. So what I put here just to make a reference, so we have one copy of the genome coming somewhere from the common vertebrate ancestor, although we're not, not entirely certain that this is already are uh, still in, in, the, in the one copy mode. It could have experienced the first duplication already. And there is then now debate whether lampreys and hackfish have experienced only one duplication before they emerged, or already two, like the jaw vertebrates to which we belong. And I also alluded to the fact that Teleosts have experienced yet another genome duplication, giving, in theory, eight copies of each of the primordial gene set. And that makes for a rather complicated structure. Now, what one has to remember is that, uh, that the fate of genes, when they are being duplicated, is not necessarily so that they are kept for the genome. I mentioned keeping genetic material going costs energy. And you don't want to keep material that you don't need. So there is a strict selection against superfluous genetic material. And that is also observed here. So teleosts by no means have eight copies of the primordial gene set. So that would mean twice as many as we have, for example, for a certain gene. That's not always the case. Sometimes it is. But for genetic screens that I discussed a couple of hours back, this can be quite advantageous. Well, it can be a disadvantage, but it can also be an advantage. The theoretical disadvantage is if you have two copies each per gene compared to our genomic set, you might say if I mutate one, the other paralog can uh, replace this function and then basically you will never be able to see a phenotype because there's always this buffering mechanism. In reality, that's of course not true. Because when genes are duplicated and the, du and the duplicates or paralogs are kept, they normally begin to assume different functions. There might be some overlap, but generally they begin to evolve new functions. So there is no possibility of complete replacement when one paralog is lost. And for the teleos situation, there can be a dramatic advantage when you do genetic screens. I give you one example. If you mutate the CXCR4 chemokine receptor, we've spoken about that one uh, uh, before, um, you have a very severe phenotype that also affects, in, in mice for example, that affects a number of organ systems, including heart, uh, uh, lymphoid development, and so forth. So it, it, it's, it's not possible for these animals to survive. However, in zebrafish, CXCR4 comes in two forms, called CXCR4A and CXCR4B. And these two paralogs have overlapping function that in aggregate would cover the functions that the mammalian single homolog would carry out. So doing a genetic screen in teleos allows you to mutate one and maintain or overcome early embryonic lethality and then study the phenotype of a subset of functions that are normally seen in one gene in the mammalian system. So that's, that can be quite useful. And in fact, this was, the, this was part of the success of this genetic screen that I mentioned before that we've, been carried, uh, that we've been carrying out and many other labs have been carrying out for teleos. So there is a paralogous function and they divide up, that is 
uh, uh, thing called sub-functionalization. So one general function is divided between the two copies. So it can be at an, an advantage and it also helps you to trace commonalities in the genetic makeup, but you will also be able, by comparing this, you also will also be able to see where innovations occur. And innovations can be by local gene duplication and diversification or emergence of new gene. And that is still, of course, one of the big biological mysteries, how new genes emerge. And I could speak for hours about this. I'll give you a couple of examples uh, why that is particularly interesting and important for the, for the immune system. Now, having um, alerted you to this potential problem of genome evolution, let's come to a summary of what we have discussed of immune systems in various stages of chordate um, evolution. So, one of the most important innovations, of course, is, and that of course goes far back more than, than the chordates, is the invention of a hematopoietic system that exists in insects and so forth. So we have a hematopoietic system that produces the most famous cell type of which I think of, of the descendants of a hematopoietic uh, progenitor stem cell are probably phagocytes. And I mentioned this, that phagocytes were the first effector type cell type in the immune system that were recognized as being protecting from uh, exogenous insult. So the hematopoietic system gives rise to a series of different kinds of myelomonocytes or myelomonocytic cell types. That gives the system phagocytic activity, but as you will now realize, it also is involved in antigen presentation. So the protein or antigen degradation that takes place in these cells is then later evolved into a means of presenting specific fragments of antigens to another cell type that emerges much later. And I discussed with you that the lymphopoietic system occurred later. And the lymphopoietic system probably occurred in vertebrates at some point or at the transition from chordates to vertebrates. And we think, of course, we do not know, but we think that perhaps the first innate or the first lymphocyte type was a perhaps what one could call an innate lymphocyte. By innate lymphocyte, I mean that it did not yet have or use somatic diversification of antigen receptors. So it would perhaps make molecules that in structure were similar or related to the molecules that are later undergoing somatic diversification. But at that time in evolution, they probably would simply be expressed at the cell surface, perhaps as multi gene families of perhaps some multi-allelic structure with a certain diversity, but not somatically diversifying. And I, just for the purpose of distinguishing them from what I will later refer to as adaptive lymphocytes, the somatically diversi diversifying ones, I call them here innate lymphocytes. So what we certainly have to say is that these lymphocytes perhaps already experienced um, a certain s a specialization in the sense that perhaps they, the lymphocytes evolved in certain parts of the organism, and we call these parts lymphoid organs. Of course, this is all hand-waving and speculation, but we can still consider this. These cells might even have had limited memory responses. And memory, as I mentioned some hours ago, memory concerns or is, is a concept describes the changed status of a system. So when we change the activity of a system, then it is moving from state A to state B, and if it um, uh, gives the immune system the opportunity to respond faster, or more specifically for the second insult, then we say that the, the system has some sort of memory. Now you can, again, when you think about it, memory can take many, many forms. And it was previously considered that memory only occurs when an immune system has somatically diversifying and clonally represented receptors on, the, on lymphocytes, because only then could a specific type of lymphocyte be stimulated to proliferate and increase clone size 
in order to be able numerically already to respond faster and more vigorously at the second time of um, uh, antigen exposure. However, we can make, and we discussed that briefly when we were discussing the DSCAM problem, you can also think of memory in different ways. You could simply say you're simply changing the composition of your, of your cell types that express one or the other type of receptors, even if you have three receptors only or even two, and they are expressed in variegated form, that is one cell expresses A, the other one rather B, nothing but this. And if then, as we discussed, perhaps one a cell with a receptor is then killed by a, a pathogen, the other one is relatively uh, uh, more frequent, and it, this could appear as memory when there is another a stimulus, negative or positive memory. So variegated expression, this is referring to what I just alluded to, is referring to non-uniform expression of certain receptors. And we know, of course, that lymphocytes express many more receptors than antigen receptors, the B cell receptors or the T cell receptors. They have many other receptors, as you know. Think of toll-like receptors and many more. And not all cells and all cell types express all receptors. So they have maybe 20 receptors to choose from, and depending on their differentiation state or their functional state, they use only a subset of those. So that is variegated expression, and that already can confer a functional difference, irrespective of whether they also have a somatically diversifying receptor complement. And then we move, at a little later, we move, and that is certainly happening in vertebrates here. We don't know, quite know where that was, but certainly vertebrates then have these so these lymphocytes that express somatically diversifying antigen receptors. And they have clonal expression, so each lymphocyte expresses only one, as we've seen. You can even have affinity maturation, that is, you can even modify after the response. If you do that right, we didn't speak about this specifically, but that is quite well known for immunoglobulins. So you can modify the structure of the antibody to make it even more uh, uh, efficient in binding a certain antigen. So there is a lot happening and there is also memory. That is clear. This is why we vaccinate ourselves because vaccination simply prepares our immune system for a subsequent attack. Now memory is an interesting con concept when you think about this because it has to do with the survival of the, um, the effector cells and Again, it comes down to metabolic or energetic efficiency. So when cells, lymphocytes, swim around in our body, they need to be maintained in healthy state and happy state, and some lymphocytes can be very long-lived. Any idea what the average lifetime of a T-cell is in my body? Seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years. Yes, yes. T-cells can be in my body for many years. And, of course, they consume energy, because otherwise they would not survive. And they need signals to tell them they are still wanted. And these signals are called trophic signals. And one important signal for T-cells is uh, interleukin-7, a particular molecule. Name really doesn't matter. But because they need specific molecules to survive, there is a limit to how many cells can survive. And if they all, if you just think of a thought experiment, if all cells need IL-7, and if I now experience an immunological reaction and I amplify the number of lymphocytes in response to a certain uh, antigen, then the number of clone A amongst the other thousand clones that I have in our thought experiment expands now in number very rapidly, and outcompetes the other lymphocytes per unit volume. Yeah, that's very easy to see. Now, if this were going on for a long period of time, then this proliferating clone would probably consume a fair share of the trophic factors that the, that the, the system can provide. So if now each and every immune reaction would induce a polyclonal response. That is, 
all thousand clones would all of, us, all of a sudden start proliferating, but there is only room for a thousand cells, say, then by necessity we would randomly lose specificities because they simply would not survive. There's not enough food around, as it were, for them to be kept uh, going. So this is why it makes sense. This is another reason why it makes sense, not only the selection that we discussed before, but this is another reason why it makes sense to limit immune responses to relatively few, or uh, relatively small compartment of your uh, 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 demanding cell type. So if you have a limited amount of trophic factors, restrict your response to only few cells. If you do this, then you can save the diversity because you never know whether the next attack is not affecting clone 1 but rather clone M. So you want to keep the clone M and you can only do this if you restrict your response to a certain fraction that will go up and then as you've read in the, note, in, in the, in the textbooks and put down in your notes, lecture notes, once the, the population increases it also crashes again, it contracts and then creates or leaves only a few cells that have the the, the, the phenotype of memory cells in the compartment just to numerically bring down the numbers again. This is what the clinicians see as lymphocytosis. When you have an infection, we normally we say we have about 5,000 T cells per microliter blood. If you all of a sudden have 15,000, you know something is going on here. And you cannot normally maintain this, and if you maintain it, there's something really wrong. It's not, perhaps not an infection, maybe something else, some lymphoproliferative disease. So that is very important to keep in mind. So memory is another system where it makes sense to have clonal expression of receptors because that restricts the immune response to a certain fraction and does not consume too much of the trophic factors. So I think that is an important consideration that one has to bear in mind. Whereas you, when you have these innate responses here, they are probably polyclonal. Many cells are being uh, activated, and then you have, then you also have to make sure that these cells do not stay at these high numbers. But this is obviously driven to the extreme when you have monospecific, clonally expressed um, uh, antigen receptors. So it seems, by looking at this, it seems as if more and more facilities were added to the system, but more and more adaptations had to be made to keep the system going. So space is limiting. We cannot increase numbers. And then somebody asked me before how many different lymphocytes we have. For example, the average clone number, that is how many cells of one particular antigen receptor type do you have in your lymphocyte pool? Any ideas? It's been studied for mostly for mice, where we have a good idea what the number is. So we have specificity A, B, C, D, E, F, and so on. How many cells of specificity A do we have roughly in a mouse? Think of a mouse, 20 grams. So this is the volume of a mouse. So how many different, how many different uh, lymphocytes are in there? Huh? 10? Any other guesses? Huh? 10,000? 10, okay. One, one more guess. 100. Here's the winner. <laughs> so the average is about 100. But now think of this. 100 cells in here. Next time you go to the laboratory, you take 100 cells and pipette them into 20, 20 milliliters of liquid, and then you try to find them again. It's not easy. So that highlights the point that I was making, that we have to think of ways of organizing our immune responses. And they come to the problem of intercellular communication. I'll come to this in a moment. Now, when we, when we now look at these, when we now look at these ever-increasing sophistication in the immune system, it's absolutely clear, of course, that we need an ever-increasing number of genes or modified genes in order to fulfill these functions and get these functions going. So let's look at some examples how the vertebrates have utilized, and I've shown you this before, but I would like to reiterate it so you uh, will remember, how, how these two arms of vertebrates have 
chosen different molecules to solve the same problem. This is an enigma which we have not yet solved. Why would early vertebrates engage independently in the same process of generating a somatically diversifying antigen receptor system? Had it happened only once, and remember I talked about lateral gene transfer in jawed vertebrates, you might as well say, okay, that was just a genetic accident, and for some, for some reason one could not get rid of it, and then we, one had to adapt to it and live with it. That's perfectly fine. I think that argument was always made, as a po or always uh, put forward as a possibility to explain somatic diversification. And it was very, very difficult to counter this argument until it was found that this happened a second time. And we know it happened a second time, as I explained, because different types of molecules were used for somatic diversification. So very briefly to reiterate, to reiterate this, the jawless and the jaw vertebrates, if you think of the genetic complement now in very abbreviated form in the vertebrate ancestor, we have immunoglobulin TCR-like genes, probably that this was a single gene that was hit then by RAG. We have this uh, glycoprotein by this complicated name, and we have these um, uh, uh, editing enzymes of the upper back uh, gene family. Now, the jawless vertebrates decided they didn't like this for somatic diversification. They instead used a system that is probably very ancient, and that is related to these upper back enzymes. And some of you might know that these, some of these enzymes in our um, in our genome are used to edit retroviral uh, genetic material and that you could consider to be a very ancient defense mechanism. You simply mutate foreign DNA and we had this at the very, very beginning and it's quite possible that this sort of very ancient defense mechanism by mutating away, as it were, uh, foreign material or dangerous material, this was perhaps then used and elaborated Two different types of such genes were generated, being expressed in different lineages, as I explained to you. This in the T-like lineages, this in the B-like lineage of Lamprey. This particular gene was duplicated and diversified into these different um, variable lymphocyte receptors that were um, then um, subjected to somatic diversification with the help of these enzymes. So this system here simply picked out of the complement, which of course is much larger, these things. Jawed vertebrates done, have gone down a different route. They've left this untouched. They've left this untouched. They've started diversifying this particular gr a group of genes, the, so the immunoglobulin superfamily fold perhaps because of this genetic insult afforded by the lateral gene transfer of these RAC recombinases. But the net result, the end result is the same, somatic diversification with all the consequences that we discussed, monolytic expression, lymphoid organs that orchestrate the development and selection and all of this, of course, for this. Um, this is uh, much speculation for the moment, but I think there are so many similarities in principle that we can safely expect that this might also be so. Now, very often people ask the question, which type of lymphocyte has occurred first? For example, in the jaw vertebrates that has been debated numerous times, is the T cell the primordial lymphocyte or is the B cell the primordial lymphocyte? For some reason, people have tended, and there are good reasons for this, tended to believe that the B cell lymphocyte perhaps was the primordial one producing antibodies, and these antibodies could then function as agglutinins or as opsonins or something like this, and only later was the same type of principle applied to T cells to build um, cellular immunity. I must admit I've changed my mind several times, so sometimes I went with the B cells, then I went back to the T cells and the B cells and the T cells. For the moment I'm siding with the T cells and the reason that I'm putting forward for the moment is, and I leave it for you to make up your mind and think about it, is that I think that antibodies 
So soluble anti-defense mechanisms are not particularly new in the immune systems of uh, multicellular organisms. And my prime example is complement. I did not have time to speak about complement, but many of you have heard about complement. Complement, particularly the C3 component, is a very um, versatile um, defense uh, 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 mechanism. As you know, this is just um, a, a very reactive molecule which will covalently uh, uh, attach itself to um, almost any type of molecule and mark it, as it were, um, for future uh, destruction. And when there is such a chemical, non-specific weapon, of course the host organism has to develop a defense system and you know all these, all these inhibitory factors that then prevent the complement cascade to start on the C3 marked um, molecules or cell surfaces are a very neat way of basically attacking everything indiscriminately and the only thing you have to do to make it work for you is to protect your own surfaces. And of course, parasites then try to adapt and mimic host surfaces or cell surfaces, for example. But that is a very efficient system of doing it. And you can think of C3, a soluble protein that swims around and attacks basically everything, of a very primitive, non-specific but efficient type of antibody. So there is some humoral type of response that is very ancient. Uh, you can find it in many invertebrates, so complement of the C3 type, as it were, and subsequent uh, effector mechanisms are very, very ancient. So my argument would go then, um, a system that is non relatively non-specific and away from the cells that make it, is not connected to cells, is an ancient mechanism, and antibodies are a bit like this. You cannot trace an antibody to the cell that makes it unless you activate a cell that makes the antibody. But we know that natural antibodies, as they are called, they are being secreted into the serum without any antigen-specific stimulation. So we have a system whereby even immunoglobulins are being made and secreted and swim around in the extracellular space and can bind antigens relatively broadly and non-specifically. This is why they are called um, this. So I thought that it would perhaps be interesting to consider the possibility that the real invention was to have antigen specificity to T cells, or linked to T cells, because T cells, as you know, and we have examples for this in invertebrates, T cells can have cytotoxic functions, and natural killer cells are antigenically non-specific, yet are very efficient in, in killing cells when they are in close proximity. And it would seem at least a possibility that if one confers now antigen specificity to a cell type that is cytotoxic, that this would really make a big difference compared to previous stages of the uh, immune system. But be it as it may, I have no idea what is true. The hope was, I think that was one of the reasons that uh, drove Max Cooper to study the immune system of jawless vertebrates in more detail in the last years, was to decide between what comes first. Well, he could not answer that question, so that you could say it was a big disappointment, but he discovered something perhaps more important, a different type of immune system using different types of molecules, all leading to the same end. So we now know that there must have been a situation, early invertebrate evolution, where somatic diversification was called for. It was not a genetic accident. There was enormous selective selection pressure to use any possibility to build this. And perhaps there was only one, I'm just fantasizing now, perhaps there was only one jawed vertebrate that survived the onslaught of whatever, changed, change in environment or change in parasite composition or whatever, because it could somatically diversify. And we entertained the possibility that perhaps this gave rise to utilizing and building 
much more complex superorganism by attracting a more complex, genetically complex and physiologically complex microbiota. Perhaps that's, that was the way to survive. And maybe the jawless vertebrates were under the same pressure, maybe not at the same time, who knows, and then invented something functionally similar but molecularly different to achieve the same end. So when you look at this, we have lymphocytes that follow the, the dichotomy of B and T cells using different types of receptors, B and T-like cells. And then, of course, once you've established this principle, there are bound to be species-specific or group-specific modifications, as we've seen in great detail, and I've given you a couple of example, examples. The Atlantic cod figuring prominently finding ways amongst a relatively conserved core of, 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 of uh, functions to deal with the losses in, in, in certain parts of it. So this all looks very similar, as you can appreciate from that sketch. I mean, this is why it was drawn like this, just to appear like this. We have the same way of um, somatic diversification. We have a, a building blocks in the genome that form the core of things, the core constant elements, as it were. And we have ways of genetically diversifying in the, in, in the soma. So just to give you another visual impression of similarities, here it is. And this concerns now the, the humoral part of the system. And there are even more similarities that you might think are somewhat astounding, and there are more to come. Um, in the near future, I'm sure. So we have here a VLR gene. This, was, this is taken from a review by uh, Max Cooper. It's not shown on here. Um, so this is the VLR gene. The first one that was discovered was, in fact, the VLRB, the antibody-like gene, if you will. So this is somatically diversifying. And then what he found was that it is also secreted upon stimulation of these cells in multimeric form. And now the amazing observation was that this multimeric form here in structure is just a copy-paste version of the antibody multimer that is being made when the antibodies are secreted in the, in the, uh, into the environment. So this, they're expressed on the cell surface, then they are shed, and they form multimers, and these multimers have a similar structure both for the VLR and for the for the antibodies. So even multimerization is a common principle. And you know what that brings you? It brings you an increase in avidity. Even if you have an antibody that by its single antigen binding site is not very, has not a very high affinity to your certain structure, by simply multimerizing this affinity, and it is antigen binding site, you're increasing overall affinity that is avidity of the complex. And the same is true for the VLRs. They also occur in complexes. So it, they're not only as monomers, but they also occur in complexes. And this, of course, if I would have told you about this, you would have thought, okay, this is science fiction. But more and more parallels in terms of organizing the system in similar ways have become apparent. So again, you could apply the argument. We do, although we do not know what the selection, selective force is, the net outcome of this is that we are multimerizing antibodies. So why should that be so? And I would not be surprised if we find more parallels between the VLR system and the, um, the immunoglobulin T cell receptor system as time goes by and more and more people are becoming interested in studying this because the group of investigators studying lamprey immun immunity is relatively small infinitely more uh, smaller than the, the group of people studying um, mammalian immune systems. So there's a lot of room should you be interested in establishing a career for yourself. Forget about this, work on this. Okay, now intercellular communication. Um, if you give me seven more minutes, we can finish this before we then have a break and then question time. So intercellular communication, we've discussed this in various contexts. We've discussed intercellular communication during development, for example, by eliminating self-reactive 
lymphocytes. They need to be exposed when they are involved to antigen-presenting cells. Those that are positively selected have a proper antigen receptor. Those that have no fit will be dying by neglect. Those that have too tight a fit will be negatively selected. So that is what I mean by intercellular communication. It's not absolutely necessary that you have this in precisely structured environments, but they need, they, the cells need to be in close opposition, otherwise this will not work because they have to directly interact. We've discussed that this also happens in the periphery when cells are activated. We have antigen-presenting cells in the periphery. Even T cells and B cells interact. T cells instructing B cells to make antibodies and secrete antibodies, and this is the process of TB uh, communication. So this theme of intercellular communication recurs many times over, and it uses different types of molecules, and in the textbook you can find many more examples that I have the possibility to discuss. But I just wanted to highlight one particular type of molecule, because that featured in the videos that I showed you some uh, time ago, chemokines and interleukins, chemokines first. So when you look at um, chemokines and, chemo and their receptors over vertebrate evolution, you will find that mammals have a great diversity of these molecules, and they come in different forms. For example, inflammatory chemokines, homeostatic chemokines and a few odd ones that we do not discuss in some dual function chemokines. So what do I mean by homeostatic chemokines? Homeostatic chemokines are those chemokines that regulate the migration interaction of cells in lymphoid organs. So just prepare cells for immune reactions. So either during development, for example, in the thymus or in the bone marrow, where cells then migrate from niche 1 to niche 2 to niche 3 to niche 4, so they know where to go at what time, a regulated differentiation. And then they are being placed in the periphery, for example, in the lymph node. They need to be in the right place for them to be able to interact properly, for example, with dendritic cells that come from the periphery into the lymph node, deliver antigen, or present antigen and then perhaps go away again. So this communication is also regulated by, by chemokines. But then when there is inflammation, of course a lot more has to happen. Then we see the action, okay? It's like um, uh, one of Arnold Schwarzenegger's movies, called into action and then everything starts. Look at these green inflammatory chemokines many, many, many of them, particularly in this CXL group. They have a different kind of internal structure, but lots of these inflammatory chemokines. Dual function ones are also quite numerous, and the blue ones are the least numerous. So we can do away with, a, with a relatively few homeostatic chemokines that sort of set the stage for the system, but when the system is called into action, then we need a lot of differentiation and activity and regulate this accordingly. So this is why these molecules or these families have expanded quite a bit. There's a lot of detail and interesting detail here which I do not have time to discuss. But what becomes really interesting is when you look at the next slide. Now we're looking at numbers. Now this is again our, our familiar scheme of vertebrate evolution going down to the C lamprey here as an example, that is, of course, the jawless vertebrates and all the rest here is jawed vertebrates, but moving up in evolutionary time, cartilaginous fishes, teleosts, um, what is that, Xenop xenopus, so that is um, um, uh, now the tetrapods, then we move into uh, uh, birds, and then we move into mammals. And now look at the numbers. Of course, there are differences, but I want you to, to look at this here. Amphioxus, there is none so far. No chemokine receptor. And is that chemokine or chemokines? No, this is chemokines here. There is no chemokine and no chemokine receptor so far. Look at human, 44 chemokines, 23 receptors. So a lot has happened in between. 
Now we look at, at, at tunicates, ascidians, none found yet. C. lamprey is relatively poor, four and five. Cartilaginous fishes, 17 and 14. The precise numbers do not matter, but you see the overall picture. It's becoming more and more and more and more. And that, of course, means it's becoming more and more complex, more and more flexible to organize and orchestrate all these uh, 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 functions. But there are also exceptions. Look at this one here, zebrafish, although I think this is an exaggeration, but we have here a much higher number in terms of chemokines compared to chemokine receptor. Perhaps that is related to the uh, uh, genome duplication that we see in zebrafish, although that's also true for these guys here, but they have fewer in number. Maybe we haven't discovered them yet, or this is an exception. But the overall trend is go from nothing to a few and then a great many. And somewhere here must the system of chemokine and chemokine receptor been invented. Now, what is a chemokine receptor in terms of structure? If you describe it, it's a transmembrane receptor, of course. Of, it has seven transmembrane domains. So it, it's, it belongs to the family of G-protein coupled uh, seven transmembrane receptors. But they exist, of course, already here, but they have different functions. They respond to different types of ligands, and presumably from this complement evolve then this chemokine, chemokine receptor gene families. But this correlates nicely with the increasing complexity of the immune system in terms of immune interactions. Not so much in terms of homeostatic regulation, but perhaps more so in regulating the immune response. And if you remember that secondary lymphoid organs, the lymph nodes, are a very recent invention, so happening somewhere up here, there is a traumatic increase in these, and that is probably also part of, this, of the system. And an, an illustration of how these gene families evolve, you can see here. For example, an IL-7 an IL receptor, an IL-17, which is also an inflammatory regulator, so not only chemokines are involved, but also these interleukins and interleukin-7. When you read the literature in, for, for mammalian immunology, IL-7 features very prominently um, in inflammatory conditions. Now here is a scheme that describes the evolution of the IL-17 receptor gene family alongside the increase in different types of IL-17s. The receptors also increase, and you can see that here. Amphioxus already has them. They are very ancient. Lamprey and shark have a few more. And then we end up with even more in, in mammals. And you can even trace where these genes come from. And correspondingly, there is evolution of the ligands. And ligands and receptor normally match. And very rarely is there cross matching. So when there is an increase in receptor complements, normally also the ligands increase so that there is always some sort of general correspondence. So again, this indicates to you, although some basic functions already existed, the emerging complexity in the immune system was then accompanied by refinement. And refinement in genetic terms means sophistication in terms of gene duplication or subfunctionalization in some way or another. So we had these lymph nodes, our amazing addition here. This is the other principle that although the primary hematopoietic tissues and primary lymphoid organs were, were very, very ancient and probably existed from the beginning of vertebrate evolution, the lymph nodes were the more recent addition that we discussed. So that gives you a feel of how much must have happened at the transition from invertebrates to vertebrates, and then subjected to refinement. <laughs>